so what's your five minute TED talk on how to pick a wine in the store? Because I, I, I always go off of the branding. I think that's like a girl thing. The more you become wine confident, right? The more you learn about wine, the easier it gets, right? The more that intimidation goes away. Wine is natural, right? Like for this generation that wants to put natural products, like wine is much more natural than a, than a hard seltzer. Tell me if I'm saying this right. How do you pronounce sommelier? Is that right? You are perfect. I got asked this yesterday during a class. They did not say it as good as you. You just said it perfectly. Sommelier. Okay. I didn't even look it up. I'm so proud of myself. Okay. (laughs) So I, Kelly, I found you through your SOM school classes. And while I already loved wine, you had a way of encouraging me to learn more about it. And before we deep dive into like, how to pick a wine at the store, organic, natural wines, things like that. Number one, what is a sommelier? And then number two, how did how did that even become your career? Yeah, that's a great question. So a sommelier is, is really a wine expert. Um, and it can be, it can look like a number of different things. So lots of sommeliers work in restaurants, right? They're the ones who would help you pick a wine off the list. Um, and then there's other sommeliers that work in education. So I got my start. I've never worked in restaurants. I actually got my start in Napa Valley. So I used to work out, uh, work out for some of the major houses out there, places like Duckhorn Vineyards, William Hill Estate. And I was an on-site sommelier for them. So I was a wine educator at these high-end wineries. And then um, my career eventually moved on and I worked on the trade side of things. So I ran the team that taught people like the Costco buyers, right? Like people who are buying train cars full of food, of wine, how, uh, how to buy wine, about wine, all the things that they needed to know, right? So my team taught the people who were going to teach the people on the floor, right? So kind of like a, a few levels back. And that level of wine education and the confidence that comes with it is really something that traditionally is only ser- reserved for people in the industry, people who work in wine. And when I decided to go out on my own and start SOM school, I really wanted to bring that high quality level of wine education to anybody who was interested. So the mission at SOM school is that we believe that everybody has a right to sit at the table, right? Everybody has a right to raise their glass with confidence and join that wine family. So that's really what we started to do. And everything that we do at some school revolves around empowering people to confidently raise their glass. Yeah, I love that. And so when you go into a wine store or e- I mean, even the grocery store, it's it's pretty intimidating. Like you said, like it's reserved for the experts to like know what they're doing. And yes. So what's your five minute TED talk on how to pick a wine in the store? Because I, I, I always go off of the branding. I think that's like a girl thing, like yeah. how appealing yeah. the label is, which I know is totally not worked out well, well for me. And my husband, he he told you this in the, in the wine class. He said he always comes home. He's picked a wine. It does not taste very good. And he's like, I just, I pan it. So let's say like, I love Cabernet. What am I looking for when I go in to buy one? Is it like the year? Is it the shelf? Can you can you elaborate yeah. on that? It's a complex question, right? So I'll do my best answer in five minutes. But the more you become wine confident, right? The more you learn about wine, the easier it gets, right? The more that intimidation goes away. But for people who are first learning, right? At the start of that journey, how to get like a quick hit of confidence. Um, what I'm always going to tell you is, and something we preach all the time at Psalm School is if you want the best bang for the buck, when you walk in a wine shop or you go to a restaurant, like wherever you're ordering wine, you want to look for lesser known grapes in lesser known regions, right? And I know this is one of the classes that you've taken with me as we've focused on if you like this profile, right? You say you like Cabernet, let's find that other places, that same structure, that same profile. It's going to taste similarly. Where do we find that where the bang for the buck is going to be the best? So when you're hunting at a wine shop, right? It's all about trying to put yourself in a position where you're in front of the most bang for the buck, best bang for the buck wines, right? So what I tell people when you go to a wine shop is, First, you're going to walk into it, right? Like walk in all the way in. Don't stop at the front because wine shops know, right? That most people you have to think through marketing. Like what's the marketing piece behind this? These are all businesses, right? I'm a business. You're a business, right? Everybody's got to stay in business. So for a wine shop, they know that the, the majority of their clientele is never going to make it past the front. They're going to walk in. 
they're intimidated, right? It's a big store. They're just going to grab something off of the end, right? They're going to grab whatever's right there uh, in the front section, okay? That's fine. Like there's fine wines up there, right? But the concentration of the best bang for the buck are never going to be there, right? Why would they put their best bang for the buck wines in the easiest access, right? They're going to put the things that they need. They're trying to market in the front. So they're going to put the things, you know, wine shops are incentivized to move different things based on, um, you know, dis different incentives that distributors are running, right? And, and people sometimes think like, oh, it sounds very like, you know, maniacal or something, right? Like, but it's not like they're just trying to stay in business, right? So whatever they're trying to push from the distributor, like whatever they're trying to push to get people to buy, that's going to be up front. But for the savvy consumer, you want to bypass all that, right? So you're actually going to go into the store, like walk in, get at least like halfway into the store. And then you want to kind of figure out how the store is laid out. And that's not hard, right? Just like look up at the signage. Some of them will have it laid out by region. Some will have it laid out by grape type. Okay. And so if it's grape type, it's a little bit easier for us in the new world. The new world being basically everybody except Europe. Europe is the old world in the world in wine. The new world is uh the us south africa chile argentina here we label our wines based off variety so lots of wine shops will be set up that way so it's like all the cab will be in this section so you like cab so you're in the store you like cab we're headed to the cabernet section and you know again you're trying to think through the marketing right like they're you're trying to think past the what how they've structured their store to sell okay you're trying to be savvy so you get to the Cabernet section, right? You're in the store. So you're already in the, but you're already moving towards better bang for the buck. And then you want to pay attention to where you're looking because if right at eye level, again, they know the easiest thing to grab is what people are most likely to do. So the harder you have to work, right? The more likely you're putting yourself in a place with a good concentration of bang for the buck. You've done that by moving into the store. Now you're going to do that by where you look on the shelf, right? Eye level, least likely to be the best bang for the buck right? Because it's the easiest, right? It's the most natural for people to reach for. So you look up, you look down, right? Somewhere that's not eye level, you're more likely to put yourself in a position to be seeing a greater concentration of bang for the buck wines. Okay. And then it comes down to knowledge, right? It comes down to getting more comfortable, learning more and thinking, okay, I like Cabernet, right? I'm in the Cabernet section. It'll also be where other full body reds are likely. So why don't I try something like Alianico? Right. Alianico is a grape from southern Italy, very similar structure to Cabernet Sauvignon. Right. It's got that big power, full body, medium plus to high tannin. Right. It's got that same black red fruit profile. So structurally and aromatically, it's going to be a very similar glass to Cabernet. In fact, we would call them laterals in the world of wine. When we blind taste, we would call them laterals, meaning these two things are going to appear similarly when you're blind tasting them. So if you're trying to enjoy them, they're going to appear similarly too. Okay, so it's something like Alianico. Or if you're the kind of person that's like, nope, I truly only drink Cabernet, like I, I'm not interested in other grapes, then you want to look to the lesser known regions, right? I've lived and worked in Napa. I've run Cabernet houses out there all about, you know, Napa wines are fabulous, but they're never going to be the best bang for the buck because Napa itself is a marketing term, right? Napa itself, people go in and they look for Napa Valley, right? That name sells. You want to be looking for names that aren't selling themselves. So places like Margaret River, Australia, right? Most people don't know where that is. They've never had a wine for there. And that works to the benefit of the savvy consumer or the savvy buyer. Margaret River, Australia is making phenomenal world-class Cabernets. And you can get them for like 20 to 30 bucks because people don't know about it. So they can't charge top dollar for a region that people aren't going in and asking for. Right. So lesser known grapes, lesser known regions. This is what you're going to be looking for in the wine shop. But it's all about putting yourself in the spot where you're most likely to see those. And that's what that, that would be my fast. I don't know, even know if that was five minutes. I might have been too long, but that's as condensed as I can give you on what I would do in a wine shop. And what I tried to tell your husband uh, in the class was it's OK to be intimidated. Right. It's natural to be intimidated. Uh, and the best thing you can do is, is put yourself in a good position in that wine shop. No, that's, that is very, very helpful. And I am the person that the marketing companies target. Like <laughs> my husband makes fun of me because I'm, he's like, Vanna, the end aisles and the like displays in the middle of the aisle, those are for people like you. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's super helpful to know that. And I think they like, I've heard that before, but with like kids cereals, like they'll put, the kids' cereals, the 
like the bigger brand names that are paying for those shelves on the bottom because they're at eye level, a level with the children. And that's like how they sell more, right? Yeah, it makes total sense. I've never heard that about cereal, but it, I mean, it, it's it's all the same kind of thing, right? It's all the same marketing and all the same strategy. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Or they have to like stay in the buggy. If you get out of the buggy, <laughs> like you lose a visit next time. <laughs> yeah, I don't even go there. You're nicer than me. I'm like, nope. Put it in the back of the car. We're picking it up. (laughs) I'm not going in. Uh, That's hilarious. So like you mentioned, we took a class and it, I, it was my first class with you and I was obsessed with it because it was, I mean, I think the title of it was how to drink for a fraction of the cost. If you like X, then drink Y. And when I went into the wine store, I had to, I was like, first of all, is there a Somalia here? And there actually yeah. was. And um, then I was like, okay, I'm just going to show you these names because I have walked down the up and down these aisles for like 10 minutes and I can't even find like the names. And that's why Brian gets frustrated because I, I say, go in. I want you to get a gamay, which I learned from your class. And he's like, what even is that? So can you explain like my favorite thing I think that I've learned is about the gamay. Cause so can you explain the gamay grape, right? It's the grape. Yes. 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 You're right. And it's how that's like, and, yeah, an alternative, but also like the indigenous part of it, things like that. Things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, they call it the wine of Psalms, Gamay, because it is such a great bang for the buck wine. Like that's what Psalms order when we go out to restaurants. That's what we're looking for on a wine list. So, um, Gamay, this is perfect that we're talking about today. Yesterday was Beaujolais Nuevo Day. So it was a celebration of, of the grape Gamay. So it's a, you know, big deal in the world of wine, sort of. Anyways, it's perfect that we talk about it today. So Beaujolais, well, first let's take a step back. In the old world, in Europe, they call the wines based off the region, okay? Not off the grape. Because it goes all the way back to the Romans. Back in the time of the Romans, the Romans are really the ones who spread viticulture and winemaking knowledge uh, like we know it today. They're the ones who really gave it a, a big push forward, all right? So the Romans weren't doing it for everybody else's benefit, right? The Romans were doing it for their benefit. So they, they're throughout their empire, they're teaching people how to grow grapes, make wine, so that they would then be sent back to Rome. When it gets sent back to Rome, they don't want it. They it doesn't. It's not helpful at all to bring back a wine and say, "Here's a Cabernet. Here's a Cabernet. Here's a Cabernet. Here's a Cabernet. Here's a Cabernet coming in from all over the empire, right? Because then they like it. They don't know where to go back to get more. So they said, here's a Bordeaux, right? Here's a Burgundy. Here's a red wine coming from this region, a white wine coming from this region. They called the wines based off the region so that when they were drinking in the Rome, they would know where in their empire these wines were coming from. So that's how we got the tradition in the old world of naming the wines off the region. And today things are very regulated in the old world. So because they've been doing wine and growing grapes for so long in these places, they know what works best. So they tell you, you can, you're only allowed to plant these grapes in this region. You have to pick them during these days. You have to stop picking at these days. Your fermentation needs to be this long. Your age needs to be this long. You have to keep it in bottle this long before you release it to market. Every part of that process is regulated because they've been doing it so long. They've been able to hone in what does well. So it gives it's hard for the buyer, right? Because when we buy a gamay, right? The grape from France, it's going to say Beaujolais, which is the region. All right. And then it's up to you, the consumer, to know that that's Gamay, which makes it hard. Okay. In the new world, very so hard. Everybody except Europe. Yeah. Makes it hard. So the new world, right? You're going to go buy a Gamay from, say, Oregon, right? It's going to say Gamay on the label, right? And then you'll see where it comes from also, but it's going to put the variety on the label because there's no regulation, right? We can do whatever we want in the new world, right? If you were to buy a red wine from Napa Valley, it's going to tell you the grape because if it didn't, it could be Zinfandel, Petit Syrah, Cabernet, Petit Verdot, uh, Merlot, Pinot Noir. Like it could literally be anything because they're allowed to do whatever they want. They just have to put it on the label for the consumer. So it makes it hard to shop because if you're buying new world wines, they'll tell you the grape. If you're buying old world wines, you have to know the grape that's done in that region because they're just going to tell you the region. All right. So Gamay is the the homeland of it is Beaujolais. All right. Beaujolais is actually the southern part of Burgundy. So a lot of people have heard of Burgundy. It's one of the famous wine regions in France. It's actually the southern part. It's technically part of Burgundy, even though people would consider it its, its own region. But it's adjoining the southern part of Burgundy. So it's just south. 
And the main grapes of Burgundy are going to be Chardonnay as the white and Pinot Noir as the red. Well, just south of Burgundy, Beaujolais, we have a cousin to Pinot Noir, which is Gamay. Okay, so this is where Gamay is, is home. This is its home in Beaujolais. And it's very similar structure to its neighbor to the north or its cousin to the north. Okay, so in terms of the structure of the wine, it's going to have a medium body, just like Pinot Noir. It's going to have medium plus acid, just like Pinot Noir. It's going to have medium tannins, right? The way you feel it on your palate is going to feel like Pinot Noir. And then the aromatics are also going to be very similar. So you're going to get lots of strawberry, raspberry, cranberry, mushrooms, potentially um, cinnamon, allspice, cloves, vanilla, right? These bacon spices that come from the winemaking process. Very similar. But because the name Beaujolais does not have the same marketing cachet that Burgundy does, right? You can get great bang for the buck Beaujolais, right? It's hard to break $30 when you're buying Beaujolais. You can buy top quality Beaujolais for $20 to $30. You can barely get That's into amazing. Burgundy for $20 to $30, right? Like yeah. it is possible, but it's very hard to buy a Pinot Noir from Bur or a red burgundy for 20 to 30 dollars right like those are often three digits four digits even higher right they can be very expensive but it's very similar structurally just to the south you've got beaujolais with gamay so that's why they call it the wine of psalms right it pairs with a lot of different foods it's it's a great wine if you're out at a restaurant and, and you want to get a, a red wine for the table and everybody's ordering different things uh and you want one wine that's going to go really well with people's food and you want it to be a red Gamay is a really good option. So that's what you'll see us ordering when we go out a lot. And it's great bang for the buck, right? Because that name doesn't sell itself. When the name doesn't sell itself, whether it's the grape name or the region name, you're getting better bang for the buck. So I love Gamay. You'll hear me preach about it all the time in classes. Perfect. <laughs> so I'm glad you like it too. <laughs> I love it. My husband doesn't love that I love it, but I actually have said he can't pronounce Beaujolais, but he'll say, you know, OK, so I'm just looking for that B word on the bottle. I'm like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned you mentioned regulations because I've listened to a lot of podcasts on wine and they'll argue that there are no regulations within the wine industry, but are they talking more of like ingredients, like organic, natural, like that side of regulation? Yeah, there's lots of regulations. So they're they're talking about they must be talking about a subset, which I can I can take a guess as to what they're talking about because there's lots of regulations, right? Um, you know, alcohol is heavily regulated in the in the U.S. So it's regulated in different ways and it depending on where we were in the old world in Europe. Again, I said they regulate every part of that process, like what you can pl like you're you're not allowed to plant Cabernet in, in Burgundy. Right. You, you're not allowed to do it. You have to plant Pinot Noir if you're going to plant a red. All right. Or maybe like there's some like very obscure subtypes, but you can't just do what you want. That's all regulated in Europe. Now, what people are most likely referring to is in the new world, right, where you can kind of do what you want, but you have to put it on the label for the consumer. And there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about whether wine bottles should have nutrient labeling on them, right? Whether they should have to list out all the ingredients, whether they should have to put the nutrients. That's probably what people are talking about. At this point, we don't have to do that. Um, and there's there's pros and cons to both sides, right? Like there's pros and cons to having the nutrients on the label and not having the nutrients on the label. So I think that's probably what they're referring to in terms of at this point, they don't have to put the nutrient, you know, like a label, like a, a food product would have it. Uh, and that comes down to practicality, right, for the winemaker, because if, you know, people can get very nervous about additives in wine, <clears throat> all right, which is understandable, right? There are some additives. Uh, well, well, we'll go there. So there's, there's a reason people are nervous. But as a winemaker, right, if you're setting out to make high quality wine, you're never going to put something in it that's going to be detrimental to the consumer, right? They're setting out to create art, right? They're crafting a piece of art. And so they're not throwing crap in it to throw crap in it. So when people push back about, okay, well, I don't want additives in my wine, a winemaker, if he's having to list everything on the label that was used in the winemaking process, gets nervous, right, that, that you would see diatomaceous earth on the label and be like, whoa, what is that in my wine? When, if you are educated, right, about the winemaking process, you know that diatomaceous earth is just ground up seashells and it's used as a, a very natural filtration process, okay? 
or egg whites, right? Monks, the monks that uh, really brought Burgundy to what it is today, right? They're, they're a huge part of why the modern wine is what it is. They kind of took over from the Romans. The, the Catholic Church after uh, the Roman Empire collapsed, the monks really drove forward kind of high quality winemaking in these old world regions. They used egg whites, right? A very natural process. Diatomaceous earth, a very natural thing, right? It's ground up seashells. And it's not still in your wine, but basically at the last part of the process, in order to get you a wine that's going to be shelf stable, right? But from when they bottle it to when you open that bottle, it's going to be true it's going to taste like what it's supposed to and it's going to be good it hasn't gone bad gone to vinegar like all wine wants to go to vinegar so we're trying to keep that from happening within a range of time okay if you keep that wine for way too long it's going to be vinegar there's nothing we can do about that but within the drinking window right we're trying to keep that shelf stable and so diatomaceous earth or egg whites right you put that into the wine the very final process and they're porous so any of the particulates any of the things that would cause haze maybe any mi uh, microbial growth anything that's going to cause that wine to be unshelf stable is going to bind to those that element, whatever you put in, ground up seashells or egg whites. And then because they've bound together, they're now heavier than the liquid around them. They settle out of the wine. You rack the wine, you move the wine off the top of it, and you get rid of that diatomaceous earth, okay? Or that uh, egg whites, whatever it is. All right. So these aren't things that are still in the wine, right? But they were used, a very natural thing was used to make sure that what you get is a product that's safe and clean. All right. But as a winemaker, right? People aren't going to know all that. And so there's pushback on the winemaking side of like, well, then maybe I just won't filter because I don't want to put diatomaceous earth on my label and have somebody not buy it because they think there's this additive that's not good to the wine, right? And so that's why there's this like pushback. It's not that winemakers want to do bad things in the wine. It's that they're concerned that consumers without a deep level of knowledge, which you don't need to know about diatomaceous earth and wine, right? Like it's like totally irrelevant to your wine drinking life. But if you're not buying bottles because that's listed, because now all of a sudden they require them to list everything that was used in the process, it can hurt the winemakers that are doing better things, right? That are making those decisions, that are putting the money to it. That's expensive, right? So you've got to put the money, put the time, put the manpower to doing that. There becomes a big incentive just not to do it, right? Because I don't want to put that on my label and have you not buy the bottle, even though the bottle is better for that. So so there, that's where like, this is the nuance, right? It's not winemakers are not out to be malicious. Now there are, I always tell people like, it is possible to have unfortunate additives to wine, right? But that's, it's really only in the cheap stuff, right? Like if you break 10 bucks a bottle, we're out, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You're out of that camp where you're getting kind of manufactured wines, right? So if you, if you're worried about additives in your wine, just drink up a little bit. And by up, I mean like 10 bucks a bottle. Like you don't have to break the bank to make sure you're in the clear, like anything past that $10 bottle, right? You're, you're drinking good wine at that point. I mean, maybe not high quality, but you're drinking stuff without, without the like yucky additives, right? The, the more manufactured stuff below 10 bucks a bottle. There are still good wines made below 10 bucks a bottle that don't have additives. You just have to know what you're doing, right? Like vino verde, you can drink great vino verde for like five, six bucks a bottle, right? high quality cab without additives under ten dollars a bottle i'm not sure you know so it, it just depends so you have to know what you're doing so if you want to just be confident that you're out of that additive range just drink 10 bucks and above and you're pretty safe you're pretty safe you don't really need to worry about it but that's where that that regulation conversation is today at least and that's kind of the sides to it that people are thinking like we want to be upfront with the consumers consumers deserve to know and have everything listed on the label is that really truly best for the consumer if the winemaker doesn't feel like they will be able to sell their bottle if they, without an extensive amount of education going into why these things were happening? That's the that's the conversation currently, and I assume what people are talking about. Yeah, that makes total sense. Do you, what are like what would people be adding to the wines that are like the cheaper ones that you're like you should not be drinking that. Yeah, it's nothing dangerous. I mean, again, these are food regulated programs. Like they, these are regulated in the US, right? Like they're not, it's not a free for all. So there is absolutely regulation. They're safe. It's just um, a lot of times those bigger brands, right? And those more, we would call them manufactured wines versus crafted wines. So they're, they're made in like the massive facilities. They're making, you know, they're tank farms, right? They're just like making massive amounts. What the... The way they're going about making their wine is they'll put together 
And there's always exceptions, right? So I'm giving you kind of the general rule of thumb. There's always going to be exceptions, but they'll put together a tasting panel. So, you know, you're, if you say you're like, you're the one that people market to, like you're probably on this tasting panel, right? They want to know what your taste preferences are. And then they're going to taste you through these ranges of aromas and say, okay, Vanna scored blackberry, raspberry, cranberry, and cinnamon as her top preferences in this experience, right? So we're going to make a wine that tastes like that. Okay, so they set out with the end goal in mind of what they want the wine to taste like, and then they work to make it taste that way versus non-manufactured wines, crafted wines, right, that are coming as are an expression of the land, the the winemaking happens in the vineyard, right? So they're growing high quality grapes, they're bringing them, they're doing the least amount to show off that land, to show off the expression of, of what that land has to offer. And this is really, I mean, the monks were the ones who really drove this, right? The monks, um, their viewpoint was that they wanted to honor the land that God had given them by making the best possible expression of wine to come off of that particular place of land. And that's still why Burgundy, where the Cistercian monks, uh, one of their home bases, right? That's still why they're so specific. You can, you drink very site specific stuff out of Burgundy, right? Like subplots of subplots of subplots. Very, very specific because they want to show off the best craft, the best piece of art from that land that, that they were responsible for, that they felt responsible for. And so that's high quality winemaking. So that mentality today of like showing off what the land has to offer, showing the best expression of that versus going into it saying, we're going to make a wine that tastes this way. Right. And then you can do different things. Like instead of using oak barrels, you use oak essence, you know, like kind of like essential oil oak added into the wine to make it to have that kind of cinnamon vanilla ish you can always tell it's it's not true, but to have that flavor profile, right? So you can do different things like that. But wine at the end of the day is, is going to be grapes and yeast, right? It's it's grapes and yeast. And so um, it's not like they're putting in raspberries or cranberries or blackberries or anything like that, but they're they're manipulating the land and the fermentation. They can do it at different heats, different lengths of times to come up with a very specific profile that they know in advance they want. So it's a different mentality, but it's they're still safe at that price point. There's they're not dangerous. There's, these are, they're absolutely regulated, right? Like it's a food product. So it has to be. Um, and especially with alcohol post prohibition in the U S right? Like things are heavily regulated here more so than in other places, but, um, they're just more, they're made on big factories versus in what you would picture, like imagine as a winery. Right. So l- let's say you do want one that's more crafted, more indigenous to a certain area that's not, that doesn't have the quote unquote additives. Like you want to be more conscious of that. How do you look at a label and tell that? Or is it kind of like you said, like when it comes from a certain region, you just know that it's not going to have those additives. Yeah. I'd say it's, it's like, it really is a price point thing. So like once you move over $10, like you're kind of out of that manufactured. Now, um, getting the best expression, like different regions have different thresholds, right? Getting in, if you want to drink Napa Valley wine, like it's really hard to do under $40 a bottle, right? Like it's hard to even get into that region under $40 a bottle. So if you want more of the like high end craft expressions out of Napa Valley, you're looking like it's a price point thing, right? Like you're going more towards like the 60 and 80 a bottle. But if you're drinking, you know, Yarra Valley, or uh, another place in Australia or Margaret River that we talked about earlier, right? 20 bucks and you're in that crafted realm, right? You're like, you're in that high end realm. So it kind of that, that threshold over 10 bucks and you're out of the manufactured stuff. But if you really want like that beautiful expression of the land, more of the artwork piece, it kind of depends on, it's a price point and it, it depends on where you are as to what that price point is, right? In, in terms of what region, how famous that region is in the world. How famous, like I said, Burgundy, right? It's very hard to get into Burgundy. You can drink Burgundy for 30 bucks, but it's not, it's not great Burgundy, right? you can drink, you can drink the best Beaujolais for 30 bucks, right? You can drink one of the 10 crews, one of the, the top dogs out of that region for 30 bucks. So it kind of depends. But as, if you want to be confident that you're drinking clean stuff, right? That wasn't, that wasn't manufactured, doesn't have additives, $10 and you're there. And then when you want to drink that artwork, right? It kind of just, the price point depends on um, where you are, like how famous the region is, how famous the region is. Lesser known regions, I'd say 20 to 30 is, is a good price point. Okay. Um, so I, when I go in and I, the wine shop that I go into has like cards, which is super helpful because a lot of them, I would say probably more like 
spirit liquor stores don't have them, but like the ones that I look for from your class, they all tend to say organic, natural, um, like, is that yeah. a thing? What, what does that yeah. even mean in the wine industry? Oh, it's, a. Uh... It's complicated. So there's different realm, right? There's organic, uh, there's natural, there's biodynamic and more, but those are the three main ones. And they all kind of mean different things. So organic is just the same thing as like an organic avocado or an organic banana, right? It's like the same regulation. They can still use chemicals, but it's only certain amounts, certain types at certain points in, in the process, right? So it's more tightly regulated, but there's, st they can still use chemicals. Okay. Just how and what is regulated. All right. So, or that's organic, right? That's a, that's a very regulated process. It's very expensive to get an organic certification. So a lot of the smaller wineries are never going to be able to afford to do that, to get an organic certification. Then there's biodynamic <clears throat> and biodynamic is interesting. Okay. So people kind of run the gamut the, in the professional world about what they think about biodynamic, I'll try and give you an unbiased perspective. Uh, biodynamic is both physical and spiritual in terms of the dimension with which they approach the wine. So they work around their vineyard and their wine based on the lunar calendar. Okay. So where the moon is in the sky determines what they're doing in the vineyard at the time. Some of that makes sense, right? Because the water table, right? You know, with the tides, like the water table changes where it is in there. So you don't want to, you want to pick your grapes when there's the greatest concentration of aromas and um, other stuff, right? Like aromas, acid, sugar, so the least amount of water. So it makes sense that you would want the water table to be at its way inside, it's further away when you're picking the grapes because the berries won't be diluted with a little bit extra water. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Um, they also like plant dung-filled ram's horns in their vineyard uh, and then dig them up and spray them over the vine. So there's like some, some weird stuff. <laughs> There's some weird stuff with biodynamic okay. and um, there's a, there's a Demeter is the organization that certifies and there's only, I'm not quite positive on this. I, I wouldn't hang my head on this number, but I think there's like a couple hundred, like 240 comes to mind, maybe 260. That's always changing, right? With regulations, but it's something in that number that are certified biodynamic in the world. So it's not very many wineries okay, that are biodynamic. It was really uh, originated in, in the Loire Valley in France. So this, this idea, the idea though, is to do the, everyone's trying to do with the best by their land, right? And so I always tell people, like, if you're buying from a, a smaller farmer, like a smaller winery, right, where more likely it, that land is theirs, right? They're farming their own land. They're making the grapes off their own land. They're wanting to pass that land down to their great, great, great grandkids, right? So they're going to do everything in their power to make sure that they're honoring the land, to make sure that they're doing the best by the land, whatever they think that is, right? If they think that's conventional farming, if they think that's organic farming, if they think that's biodynamic farming, your land is your most valuable asset as, as a winemaker, okay? Your land is your most valuable asset. So if you're buying wines, if you're drinking wines from the smaller guys, it's more likely that they're going to hold, their land is their most valuable asset that they want to pass on to their, their great grandkids. And so they're going to do the best by that, right? Like no one's trying to trash their land. None of these small guys, none of the small wineries are trying to trash their land because they want to pass it on to their kids, right? And their kids' kids. So just because somebody doesn't have a certification, right, doesn't mean they're not doing everything to like honor the earth and make sure that they're they're doing right to make like grow really healthy vines on a really healthy piece of land that then translates to really great wine. Okay. It's just how they approach it. So you got conventional farming, you've got organic farming, you've got the biodynamic with its physical and spiritual aspects. Um, and then you've got natural wines. And natural wine, there's zero regulation. Okay, so that may have also been something that they were talking about when you've heard about no regulation in the past. So there's no regulation around natural wines. There's things that you are and aren't supposed to do, but there's no one that's like going in and certifying like anybody could call themselves natural. And I think the like kind of stepping back, the wine industry has done a very poor job of saying all wine is natural right? Wine is a very natural product. And so that term has kind of been commandeered by what we'll talk about in a second, but all wine is natural, right? And so for people that are wanting to, to, to drink more and putting out more natural things in their body, right? I, I, I mean, I drink across the spectrum. So I think, you know, kombucha is great. Cocktails are great. Beer is great. Hard seltzers are great. But wine is one of the most natural products you can drink, right? Because it's naturally occurring, right? Like a grape gets ripe, 
it bursts open. There's yeast naturally occurring in the air. The yeast goes inside that berry that's naturally occurring outside in the environment, starts to eat that sugar. You get wine. Man does not need to be involved for wine to happen. It's the most natural process, right? And so wine is natural. All wine is natural. The natural wine movement, right, how that term has kind of been commandeered recently, is really refers to a low interventionist philosophy, okay? So they can do whatever they want, but in, normally, as low interventionists, as would be their kind of guiding principle, they're not going to use chemicals in the vineyard, um, and they're not going to use any kind of additives we'll talk about it in a second in, in the winery so they're they're very they're kind of just like letting things happen all right they're letting things happen in the vineyard these are often the ones that are using like horse uh like horse and plow to to work their earth right if you see that like that's probably natural wine like which is interesting because you know at what point do we decide technology is good or not right like why was the horse and plow the end of the technology that we're going to embrace like why can't we embrace other versions of tech so they've decided like this one very specific um time period is what they're going to call like all right we're not going to take te technology past this point in the vineyard in theory again no regulations everybody can do what they want the big thing about natural wine is because there's no regulation around it you never really know what you get and there's lots of variation within the bottle and even sometimes like between bottle to bottle and then also within one bottle so as a professional, it makes it very hard to recommend a bottle because I don't know that what I had is going to be the same thing that you had. Because in the winery, they also don't put sulfur is a very not is a uh, natural element, right? It's naturally occurring. It's naturally occurring in wine. It's a natural byproduct. And winemakers will also use a trace amount of sulfite to preserve a bottle at the very end. So right at the end, after they put it in the bottle, they put a trace amount of sulfites. Okay. People blame this for their headaches, right? People say, oh, I'm allergic to sulfur uh, or sulfites, which is why I can't drink wine. Okay. Sulfur is a natural, sulfites are naturally occurring. The amount that they put in a bottle of wine is a trace amount. In the U.S., again, things are regulated. So if it contains more than 10 parts per million, you have to put on the label that it contains sulfites. However, it is possible for you to be allergic to sulfites. That is a thing. It is possible. It is incredibly rare. And if you're allergic to sulfites, you have massive dietary restrictions in your life outside of wine right? A can of soda has double the amount of sulfites in it than a glass of wine. A dried apricot has four times. One dried apricot has four times the amount of sulfites in a glass of wine, okay? So it's possible that you get wine headaches from sulfites. It is incredibly rare, and you've got other things happening in your life, right? It's not just wine that you can't consume. So it's a very small amount. So people get worried about like, oh, there's sulfur in wine or sulfites in wine, their sulf sulf sulfites are naturally occurring. They're in lots of our food products, naturally. They're naturally in them. In the natural wine movement, right? Again, this is why this term is hard because wine is natural, right? But for this this kind of trendy movement that we're talking about, they don't put any sulfites at the end of the, at the, end of the winemaking process, okay? So they don't do any of that because they're low interventionists. But that means there is a strong possibility that when you open that bottle, however many months or years later, after they bottle it, it's no longer good, right? It's no longer true because sulfites are a preservative. And so you've done, it's like, if you're a preparer, right? Like if I'm throwing it at a dinner party and I'm going to serve guacamole and I'm like, well, I'm low interventionist. I'm not going to put lemon juice on the top because I want it to taste like pure guacamole with nothing else. Well, if I serve that to you, you know, even the next day, it's brown on the top right? You need to preserve things, right? And acid is naturally preserving, hence lemon juice and guacamole is a natural thing. Sulfites are naturally occurring. And so they use that to make sure that when you open the bottle, it's exactly how it's supposed to be, that it's good, it's clean. And so there's a lot of, there's good stuff happening in the natural, under the natural banner of wine. Uh, and there's also a lot of stuff that's no longer good, right? Because it hasn't been done correctly and the bottles isn't good when you open it and you don't know. And then the amount of natural wine, I think it's like three or 4% of, of wineries that would claim like that natural wine banner. And the amount of space they get in a wine shop is disproportionate, right? You walk into a wine shop nowadays and you see a whole section of natural wine. It's very trendy, right? It does not represent the three or 4% that it actually is in the world of wine. So it's getting a much louder voice, right? Because people are nervous, like they don't understand. And when it's, and that's what's hard about what it's, it's hard about wine, right? Because there is so much to it, right? There's the diatomaceous earth that we talked about or egg whites, like all these different parts of the process that can make it sound like intimidating or very manipulated or very, you know, like 
that's not something I want to put in my body. But the more you learn, right, the more you realize like, oh, no, this is this is a very natural product. This is a very safe, right? There's nothing in here uh, but natural things, right? But then there's been this movement of like, oh, let's latch on to that idea that people want to have very natural products. We'll call ourselves natural and we get kind of more of a floor space than than our representation in the wine world would merit. So I'm not against natural wines. They're just challenging because you never know what you're going to open. You don't know what you're going to open, right? It, it could be fabulous and it could be totally bad versus with anything else you're pretty much like that bottle is going to be true. As long as you've stored it correctly, like that bottle is going to be good. If it, if it's had that little bit of sulfite to preserve it, right. Whether you like it or not is a different story, but you know, at least you know, you're that you're, you're judging apples to apples, right? Like you can really judge whether you like that grape type or that region or that producer, because you know, the wine is good and the natural wine. You don't know if what you're drinking is what the winemaker was hoping you'd be drinking. Well, and it sounds like you, you don't even know if it really is natural. Like even if they say they're natural, are they really? Yeah. Because there's no regulation. There's no certifying bodies. There's nothing. Uh, you can just call yourself natural. Yeah. But all wine is natural. And that's the thing. I think the wine industry has done a bad job of saying, like, wine is natural, right? Like, for this generation that wants to put natural products, like, wine is much more natural than a, than a hard seltzer in a can, right? Like, it's much more natural. Because wine's going to happen whether man intervenes or not, right? That seltzer's not, right? But, you know, that's how, you know the gift of wine was given, right? It's going to happen in the vineyard and we can be a part of that, right? And we can bring it into the winery and, and be a part of that process, but it's going to happen with, with or without us. And you said, you talk about the sulfite movement. Is that the same thing as nitrate? Cause I see more of that than sulfite. Yeah, no. And I can't speak to nitrates too much. That's a different sulfites is the main one in wine. Cause that's what's used at the end. Um, but nitrates is, is different. Are sulfites the thing that people are like, the fitness people are like, yeah, make sure you get a low sulfite wine. Yeah, they'll also talk about like low sugar. It kind of just depends on whatever like bandwagon or, like, you know, whatever you think the like the bad thing is, is what, you know, people jump on. So I hear a lot of, um, you know, like, oh, drink wines that are lower in sugar, right? Or like, you know, keto, like, oh, I can't have these wines because there's sugar in them or whatever. Um, so it kind of depends on whatever you think the bad thing is. Um, and in terms of sugar, like, again, there's no, <clears throat> there's no additive in terms of sugar to wine. Like sugar is, uh, is natural, right? A, a grape gets ripe as it's going through the ripening process, which we call verasion, the acid, which is sky high at the, the start starts to drop and the sugar rises. So they're not bringing in the grapes and adding, you know, a bunch of like cane sugar into the tank and letting that ferment. It's naturally occurring sugar. And the yeast is going to, that's their food. And so the yeast that's naturally occurring in the air, right? It's also naturally occurring in wineries. Like think about sourdough bread. That's so trendy right now. Like yeast is naturally occurring. So naturally occurring yeast, you can also inoculate with specific strands. People do it both ways, but it's all natural, right? The yeast starts to eat on the sugar. The byproduct of that alcoholic fermentation is carbon dioxide, heat, and alcohol, right? So the carbon dioxide blows off, right? Unless you're making like a sparkling wine or something or Beaujolais Nuevo, a different story, but it blows off, right? They have the tanks open. So that goes away. The heat, right? Kind of dissipates into the air. They can also do cooling jackets to control that. So you're getting the alcohol, right? That's how we're getting an alcoholic beverage is, is through the yeast. So the yeast are going to eat all that food that's available to them. They're going to eat all the sugar and then they die off uh, when they don't have enough food left, which is right before all of the sugar would be gone. But that level of natural sweetness, that natural sugar from the grapes, from the berries, is below the threshold of perceivability. Okay, it's very low. Okay, you cannot perceive it 99% of the time, right? Unless we're trying to purposely make a sweet wine, okay? So when people are anti-sugar in wine, right, there is no additive. It's, again, it's like, we, it's and it's very easy, right? We can do this in other worlds too. It's not just wine where this happens, but you hear one thing, right? And people kind of latch onto that of like, oh, there's sugar in wine. I don't want to have, I don't eat sugar, so I'm not gonna drink wine anymore. Well, that's not really the case. It's not like a Diet Coke, right? Or a regular Coke, right? They're like very different, right? This is naturally occurring sugar. The yeast eat all of it. It's below the threshold of perceivability almost always. Now, if you are, if you do or don't want a wine that tastes sweet, that actually has perceivable sugar to it, you're just going to look at the ABV, the alcohol by volume, right? Because if that yeast has eaten all that sugar, the wine's going to be at least 12% alcohol. Okay. So for that ferment, we would say it's a complete fermentation. It's a finished fermentation. The wine will be at least 12% alcohol. It can be all the way up to 15, maybe a little 15 and change, right? But 
normally 12% means that the fermentation has finished. They, on average, are more like 13 to 15. If you flip that bottle over and you look at the ABV and that ABV is under 12, then you know that wine was made in a sweeter style. There is actually going to be perceivable sugar to that. Okay, so if you want to avoid that perceivable sugar that below the or above the trace amounts, then you just want to make sure you buy a little bit higher ABV to make sure that fermentation finished, right? And it's not a bad thing if the fermentation doesn't finish. It's just a different style of wine. Things like rosé, I tell people to check the ABV on rosés because those can be made in a dry or sweet style. Gewürztraminer is a grape that can be made in a dry or sweet style. We call it the grape that's easy to drink, hard to say. It's great. It's a, You can just tell your husband to buy the G1. He has the B1 that he buys, you can buy the G1 too, <laughs> the Gilbert's Terminer. Uh, but it can be made in a dry or sweet style. Riesling can be made in a dry or sweet style, right? So if you're in that category of wines that maybe have a sweet version, right? And a lot of this happens with rosé and Riesling. This is where I hear it a lot where people are like, oh, I'm too nervous to buy rosé because I don't want to buy something that's sweet. Just check the ABV because if it's over 12%, it's not going to be sweet. It's not going to be sweet. Super helpful. Um, and bef before you go... You have mentioned wine will go bad or like the drinking window. Can you explain, and I'm sure it's different for every grape. Can you explain what the drinking window is essentially? It's yeah, a great question. So 99% of wine that's bought in the U.S. is drunk within a week. All right. You're going out and you're buying stuff for this weekend. You're buying stuff for tonight, for your class, for your dinner party, whatever you're doing. You're buying it to drink soon. Okay. Winemakers know this. Again, just like wine shops are aware of where people are going to go, where consumers are going to go, how they're, they're buying practices, winemakers know this. Okay. And again, it's not a manipulative thing, but they're aware of drinking trends. And so as a good winemaker, they want to make sure that what they make is ready to be, is going to be at its best when you're going to drink it. And so if they know that you're going to buy it within a week, they're crafting their wines to make sure they're ready to drink in that window, right? To drink immediately. To, we would say to drink upon release. Okay. So most wines today are made to be drunk upon release versus, right, if you look at a region like Bordeaux, right, some of this is changing, but traditionally Bordeaux, you didn't want to open those bottles for like at least two decades, right, maybe longer, like they were not made to drink upon release, they are not good upon release nothing wrong with them, right? But they're not going to taste at their best. Like they're going to taste at their best in a couple of decades so that you had to hold on to them. And, but you also inherited cellars, right? Like you got your parents or your grandparents cellar. So you inherited all these wines and then you collected wines to pass on to your kids and grandkids. Did you inherit a cellar, right? Like I, <laughs> I didn't inherit a cellar. doesn't happen in the new world. Like this is not how things work here. And so we know that what we're, what we're buying, we're consuming pretty quickly. Okay. So most wines right? It depends on, like you said, the grape type, it will, will differentiate. But a good rule of thumb is that most uh, white wines are going to be at their best between now and five years, right? Like you don't typically want to wait more than five years on whites. There are lots of exceptions, right? I have whites in my cellar that I plan to hold for a couple decades, but you have to know what you're doing, right? It has to be a very specific grape type. It has to be a very specific producer, the right vintage, these kinds of things. So most whites, right? Three to five years are going to be their best. And they're not bad after that. They're just going to start to taste worse and all things move towards vinegar, right? All wines move towards brown and all wines move towards vinegar. So it's just going to become vinegar with time. Red wines, it's a little bit longer, like five to eight years, more like on the five side, right? They're going to be red wines. They have a little bit more naturally occurring preservatives like tannins, which are part of a red wine. Those are also act as preservatives, right? So a little bit higher alcohol, typically alcohol can be preservative. So they have a little bit higher preserves. So you, instead of being more on the three side, you're more on like the five, maybe eight side, depends on the grape type. Okay. And again, they're not bad afterwards. They're just no longer going to taste good afterwards. They're going to start to die is what we would say. So there's uh, a few exceptions like um, rosés are meant to be drunk current vintage. Okay. So if you go to a wine shop, what is it? This is 2023. We've already had the harvest. I would not buy anything older than 2022. Okay. Last year's harvest, right? You're trying to buy current vintage. Rosés is the way they're made, right? This is a whole other class for a different time, but the way they're made is they're meant to be drunk young and fresh. Okay. So the lighter the body of the wine, same thing like Sauvignon Blancs. Don't buy old Sauvignon Blanc, buy current vintage. Pinot Grigio, buy current vintage, right? Like wherever we are in the harvest cycle, harvest is in the fall, right? In the Northern Hemisphere, it's in the spring, in the Southern, 
But so 2022 is the oldest I'm drinking of any of those kinds of categories. Chardonnay, fuller bodied white, right? This is where it comes to the nuances. I might buy something that's two or three years old. That might be current vintage for that producer. But those light bodied rosés, Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc, things like that, make sure you're buying current vintage and drinking current vintage. Don't hold rosé in your cellar, right? Don't hold those really light whites in your cellar. Drink them. So most wines are meant to be drunk young, right? They're meant to be drunk now. They're ready to be drunk now. And then if you are the kind of person that wants to start collecting wine, again, this is a different class I teach how to start your own wine collection, but uh, you just need to know, you need to learn about grape types. You need to um, learn about, you know, specific regions, specific vintages, or bring on a, a professional to, to help you curate that or to buy that. Uh, but most wines you want to operate within that. Drink current vintage. You can hold some whites three to five years, reds five to eight, maybe. But after that, it's not doing you any favors. And my last thing I'll say on aging is if you're going to hold a bottle, please don't put it in your kitchen. I see a lot of people and they're storing their wine for whatever anniversary celebration or kids 21st and it's up in the pantry, right? Like that's terrible. Okay. The things that will cause a wine to break down too soon are going to be light, heat, and vibration. Light, heat, and vibration. Those are going to break down a wine and cause it to go bad soon. Think about your kitchen, windows, ovens, dishwashers, fridges, light, heat, vibration. It's the worst place to store wine. Like I don't even keep wine in my kitchen for like a week, right? I don't keep wine up there at all. You want to keep it somewhere where it's going to be away from those three things, those three culprits that would break down wine. So basement is a great choice if you have a basement. If you don't have a basement, the guest room closet in your house is what I always tell people, like a closet that's going to be open the least so it'll stay dark the most, right? And down on the floor, right? So it's going to be in the coolest part of that closet. Think about where in your house is going to have the least amount of light, the least amount of heat and no vibration around it. So that's, if you're going to hold something, if you've got that special bottle that you're holding on to, put it in somewhere away from light, heat and vibration. Okay, had no, had no idea. And I usually will see wine on top of people's fridges, which sounds like the worst place. It is the worst place. It is the worst place. Yeah, and it's a very easy fix. It's a very easy fix. Just go throw it in a closet somewhere on the ground, not up top. Okay, Kelly, thank you so much for letting us pick your brain. I feel like I could literally talk to you for hours. And I actually have <laughs> taken two of your classes, which has been two hours. I have so many referral credits because I've sent so many people to your class. I really do think, and with my referral credits, we're definitely going to take like um, all of your intro classes to get like awesome. a better baseline. Yeah. So can you tell people how they can find you like social media and how if they want to take classes with you how can, they can do that yeah absolutely so yeah i'm on um instagram psalm school s-o-m-m -M school all one word and then uh, my website is psalmschoolwine.com that's where we always keep the updated class list so i offer kind of a number of range of things that people want to uh take classes and learn more there's the public classes uh that you guys have done where you can just buy a seat or however many seats you want in a public class and we keep the headcount small on those so that they're highly interactive uh as you know so that way you really do get you walk out really feeling confident and equipped because we keep them small so they're very interactive so you can do public classes. I also offer private classes, right? If you want to get a group together and just have it be your solo group, we do that. We do corporate events. And then um, we have a wine membership too for people who want to have a class every month with me and really take it to the next level. We do, we have exclusive classes for our members and then they get access to that whole confident, your confident foundation series, which is we offer some of our most popular master classes uh, on demand on our website and then the decanted membership, you would get the Your Confident Foundation. So that's how to taste like a pro, mastering food and wine pairings, and the world's most popular grape. So a really good foundation there. So different aspects depend on kind of how you want to go about it. If you want to do a one-off class and try it out, which is what most people do. And then uh, typically from there, people join the wine family, as we say, uh, and get that the decanted so that they can have that foundation course uh, in addition to the exclusive classes. So a number of different ways depending on people's interests and desires, um, but would love to see you and your following join us for some in the future. Perfect. I will link all of this for you guys in the show notes. And Kelly, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me.